Hey guys, this is my buddy Dylan. He's my homeboy. We, um, he's one of the dealers in San Antonio. Honestly, one of the best dealers in my opinion. So if you are a card house owner, I would really look into hiring this guy. So um, we're just literally gonna talk strategy and just some ideas that have worked for both of us and see where it goes. So what are some of the topics you wanted to talk about? Yeah, specifically multi-way pots, bet sizings. Usually people say to go small in multi-way pots, which I don't see as a bad thing. Um, I think it's a good strategy, but um, say you're betting range into two opponents, three opponents possibly, which I mean, isn't necessarily recommended. Um, but there's a lot of multi-way pots in San Antonio. I think that just as a, for you, I was getting some coaching from Faraz Jaka, right. who's a beast, like one of the greatest players. I was like, hey man, I need help with my multi-way pot stuff. He's like, okay, I got this, let's talk about it. And he gave me like a hand where there's three people in the pot. I was like, I guess that is multi-way, you know? Then the next hand was three-way, and the next way was three-way. I was like, hey bro, like I need multi-way pot stuff. And he's like, these are, these are multi-way hands. I was like, no, I'm talking about five way, yeah. six way, bro. Like it's Texas, man. And he goes, he goes, that doesn't happen very much. Like you're not going to need that a lot. And I said, bro, that's like every hand in Texas. Cash games in Texas, man. <laughs> Everybody calls. They they'll call you your three bet, multi way, like five or six ways. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of books on this topic. It's like super. Um, I think it's a little bit of a mystery. Still, even the best pros are learning tricks on this. Right. So yeah, I mean, so let's explore that. And then you want to talk about bluffing or how to play against a short stack. Right. And then, um, well, let's, let's just stick to that. And then if, if we get through all that, then we can um, talk about other topics. Cool, man. Let's talk about multi-way first because it's just the juiciest thing. Right. And multi-way pots, let's, in a lot of scenarios, in the way that we talk about it, you should be the one, raise, if you're gonna enter a pot, you should be the one raising. Agreed. A lot of these multi-way pots will be where you raised it pre-flop, and I think a good standard raise at these 1-2 games is probably 15. Agreed. Anywhere from 11 to 15. I think when you're raising more than 15, I just think it's a little excessive unless the game is genuinely good for, like you, unless they'll call you. Yeah, really depending good. on straddles and everything in the table, but um, I feel like anything less than a $10 open, especially here in Texas, it's just... It's a an joke. It's an invitation. Yeah. To, <laughs> it's an invitation. Like, I mean, genuinely. Yeah. So people just don't respect. In fact, they don't even respect the fifteen dollar raise much. But I, I think that if you're raising more than fifteen to twenty pre flop, and I'm talking if there's no straddle, by the way, right? Then um, you're forcing people to fold out their crappy hands, and not letting them call with their crappy hands, and you're kind of you're kind of forcing people to play good at that point. So you still you you want to find that right balance to raise enough to where they take it somewhat serious, but not so serious that they play perfect. Right. In multi-way dynamics, a really important aspect is you want to be able to start somewhat ranging people. A really good advantage of that is raising pre-flop, and the way that I like to th think of it is like you want to thin the herd a little bit. You want to like trim the fat. So you want to you want to raise enough to to knock out some of the nonsense like the 9-3 the offsuits, like even though you're okay if they call, it's just, it's hard to win in multi-way multi pots as it is, right? And a lot of bull crap is still gonna call you, but if you, you wanna raise enough to kind of somewhat thin the herd, but still be not too much to allow people to call you with jack seven offsuit. Right. And they're bad, they're bad hands. So saying that, when you do, when you are the raiser, make sure that you raised enough to have some kind of information, right? That's huge for multi-way. So um, in other situations, let's say someone else opens in your late position and you have nine, seven suited. That's for sure. You should you should get into all these multi-way pots with all these suited connectors and suited gappers if Agreed. it's cheap, right? Especially um, if you're getting the right odds. I mean, you're getting a good price to call and hit your hand. Exactly. And if you do, you get paid. Right, so one trick in multi-way pots is especially in position, you want to try to get in there with as many pocket pair, especially if the stacks are deep. This is assuming that in a lot of these one-two games, the stack sizes are so deep, like people have 500 big blinds type thing. So you want to get in there with as many pocket pairs, suited connectors and suited gappers as you can, because you're able to see a, f a flop for really cheap. And when you flop the essential nuts or when you flop such a strong hand, one thing in these multi-way pots is that people don't fold. It's very difficult to make people fold. Right. 
So that's one thing I was gonna tell you about. So you wanna be very, like we'll talk about that in a second, but basically an important thing to know that is in a multi-way pot, there's almost always gonna be people that call you, one or two people that call you when you're be being aggressive. For sure. So there's no need to slow play your strong hands. Like when you flop a set, a middle set, or you flop a straight, you should go ahead and bet the flop. Agreed. Uh, because nine out of 10 times, they're just gonna call you down, especially if it's a really draw heavy board. Um, I don't see a problem with betting big to get value from those draw heavy hands. You know, like yeah, combo exactly. draws, straight draw, flush draws, stuff like that. <clears throat> Even like, let's say the board is like queen, queen seven deuce and you flop the set of sevens, go ahead and bet it in the multi. You don't need to slow play, bet it because people are gonna call you with pocket nines and, and, and a weak queen and they'll right. just literally call you flop, turn and river. Like they'll, they, they'll just call you down. So the good thing, is, there's goods and bads to multi-weight, but if you think of the principle that people are gonna call you down very, very light, you have to remember that before you decide to pull a bluff. Um, in fact, like I actually am super, super hesitant to bluff in multi-weight pots. So am I. Because with how call heavy it is here in San Antonio, mm -hmm. I mean, you're not gonna get much accomplished. Exactly. Um, so. And, and, and a lot of people, like, they take C betting overboard. So, like, people, especially people that are getting better, like, tr they're trying to improve their game, they feel pressure to C bet. And so they raise pre flop, they have ace king, five callers, the flop is, you know, queen nine three, you know, um, they C bet. But it's like, that don't, don't, you don't have to C bet on this board. Yeah, they're not going to fall. That's fold. just lighting money on fire. Exactly. Like, like all the th principles that you've learned, that, like, with, Sea betting and all that stuff like it's so different a multi-way if you if you whiff the flop and people are in the hand and you're you don't even know if you have outs at this point so just check fold so these are just general tips and um multi-way what i want to talk about is let's say you do you do you raise with ace king and the flop is king 10 6 you flop top top okay but there's five people in the hand right how do we, is this kind of a situation you're talking about? Like, how do you proceed in these spots? Exactly. Because a lot of people say bet small. I think that's just inducing a raise from someone else. And then sometimes you won't know where you're at in the hand. Just in general, if there's four or five people in the hand, I, I'm playing pretty ABC. I'm not gonna bluff. I'm not even gonna bluff my big draws very often unless I have a really specific reason to. The question is whenever you do flop a good hand, what I would recommend is proceeding with a lot of caution because there's so many donkeys that are calling you and there's so many people that flop two pair or they, you know, they flop draws that they won't fold. And it's so easy in multi-way pots to get just coolered. Agreed. So rather than thinking about maximizing value, I wouldn't recommend maximizing value. I would recommend being kind of risk averse. Meaning, try to, to like try to dodge coolers, but you still want to protect your hand. So, so when I say that, I'm saying like you're gonna make a lot of your money in poker, especially these stakes when you flop big hands because people don't fold. For sure. But where you lose a lot of your money is when you get coolered. You need to be able to kind of recognize where you're at. And so, saying that, going back to what you're saying with when people say bet small on the flop or whatever, what I like to do is if if I flop a good hand, I don't slow play it. Um, and I don't I don't like to down bet because... Yeah, not in multi-way pot. Not in a multi-way pot because people, if one person calls, then the whole table, the yeah, whole, everyone will call. It's an invitation. Yeah, and then you get put in bad spots of raise. But you don't want to bet the pot either. Like, so a lot of people, they raise with ace-king, the flop is ace-nine-four, and they'll just bet the pot. And you, you got to be very careful because people are calling you with ace three suited and ace nine suited and right. pocket threes and all that. So you have to, you have to kind of like somewhat pot control. So there's a, it's a weird little dance you have to make. I recommend betting about half the pot, maybe even a little more than half the pot, because what it does is you're not having to risk heaps of money, but you're also, you, you want to bet enough to, to fold out the, the bull, the bull crap. Right. But you still want to like bet enough to where they'll call you with like somewhat made hands and you know, let's say you, you, you have ace king, you, the flop is king 10 four. You, if you bet half pot, queen jack is never gonna fold. 
they're open-ended. So if someone has a jack-10, they're gonna call you with a pair of 10s. All the, if someone has a king, the. they're gonna call you with king-9. They're not gonna they're not gonna fold no matter how much you bet. For sure. So, and it, I wouldn't I wouldn't take checking out of the question either, because if you check and someone leads out with like a worse king, they'll never put you on top pair. Ex exactly. Almost always, as crazy as it sounds, like I incorporate a lot of checks. If I'm out of if I'm the pre-flop raiser, I check most flops with ace high flops or king high flops. Right. The reason why I do that is because if I have like pocket jacks or I gotta protect my range. So if I have pocket queens or pocket jacks, I probably would check there, right? Sure. And yep. you don't, uh, it avoids bloating the pot as well. That's it. So, so that's the key <clears throat> to these spots is you wanna avoid bloating the pot with marginal hands, like with one pair of hands. Um, but what I like to do is I like to check and it allows you to decide. It kind of gives you an option because if they bet, you can decide to call or you can check raise your hand. If I'm out of position with the same board, king, 10, four, I have ace, king. If I check, let's say someone bets 20 bucks, call, call, call. And as you're watching them call, you can kind of tell that nobody has that super strong of a hand. Yeah. But everybody's got a little bit of something. I, I might elect to check raise there, actually. Agreed. So I might raise that to like 170, like something stupid, um, because one person might call me with a weaker king. For sure. And you get a better understanding of where you're at. Exactly. At that point. So checking out of position is very powerful, but you, you're pot controlling. You, you're not trying to blow the pot with a like a marginal hand. But also, if they bet, then you can actually p potentially just take the pot down by raising, or you get value from worse hands. You can isolate it to heads right. up. So playing out of position is very different than, than in position. Whereas like if I'm actually in position and in a multi-way pot and then they check it to me, I'm gonna bet about half the pot. Okay. So if the pot's $100, I'll probably bet like 55 to 65. I like that sizing. Yeah, it, it forces them to respect it. It also like, if I was to bluff in that hand, I, if I had like a backdoor flush draw with like ace queen suited and a Broadway draw, and if I sense that nobody really has kings in their range very well, if I ever was to bluff in that spot, I might I might do like ace queen suited on a king 10 board. For sure. Because majority of the time you'll still have a good amount of equity. Yeah, because you gotta remember in these, if you're gonna be betting, playing these multi-way pots, the way you win them is not by a single bet. Like you're not gonna win the pot on a, a C bet on a flop very often. Um, it often is gonna take a double barrel or like a big, like a bet on the flop, everyone folds except one person, check, check on the turn, and then on the river, if, if, if you can kind of tell that they missed draws or they just have a 10, right. and or they have a, you can tell that they have a very marginal hand, you might m make a big river bet and take it down. For sure. I yeah. think after C betting flop, turn bets get a lot more respect than a C bet. I know we've been over this before. So much, so yeah. So if, if you're trying to get folds out of someone with a hand like ace queen, mm -hmm. Then yeah, I think betting turn, um, sizing up is good. Generates a lot of folds. Exactly. From that, my experience. That's really, really powerful too. So what you're really trying to do, when you raise a pre-flop, you really, ideally, you kind of want like maybe one to two callers. That's like mm -hmm. perfect, you know? But when you get four or five <clears throat> callers and you do flop a good hand, your, your goal is at this point is to, typically, if you have a value hand, I like to try to bet to get to where there's just like one or maybe two callers because it's just, it's so much easier to win the pot against one-on-one -on -one heads up pots. So you wanna really bet the flop. The goal is to thin the herd, basically just like weed out all the bull crap and get it heads up where you probably likely have the best hand. You have a strong hand, you're in position, playing against the calling station and the pot's somewhat big. So you're gonna get to kind of elect to build that pot up even bigger or just kind of pot control and check back a lot of your stuff. So that's the goal in multi-way pots. If you completely whiff the flop, I would just recommend like just check fold. You don't wanna really get caught up triple barreling your stack against these against a bunch of donkeys, like calling stations. Essentially, yeah. Because the problem is, is like there's just so many good, easy spots that you can choose to participate in. There's no need to just go like barreling off your stack. Agreed. Yeah. And if you're going to be c-betting, it is a little better to c-bet um, with the intention of being very strong on the turn. So in your experience, why don't you talk a little bit about your experience in like, let's go multi-way pots like with only one or two, maybe only the other two players. What do you mean by 
betting bigger on the turn versus the, the flop? So um, majority of the time people I've noticed bet around one third to half pot and you know, three way pot for the most part. On the flop you mean or the turn? On the flop okay, as yeah. a C bet, most aggressors will. Assuming it gets down to heads up on the turn, mm -hmm. sizing up to around three quarters, maybe 80% pot. Mm -hmm. um, I think is good, especially if you're bluffing, trying to generate folds. You could also do it with your value hands, especially if it's a draw heavy board. Right. You know, you're balancing your range, um, getting value out of whatever they may be calling you with, whether mm -hmm. it be a worse pair, combo draw. So you think it's more effective to bet heavier on the turn than maybe the flop? I do, because it definitely gets more respect. Mm -hmm in my opinion, because say you get heads up with a guy, you raise like 15 pre, one guy calls, and you bet 10 on the flop, mm -hmm. a third pot. Majority of the time, he's not gonna fold. He's gonna continue with a lot of his backdoor hands, middle pair hands. They won't They won't give up on the flop. Yeah, yeah. I know. Even bottom pair hands, I've seen people just continue for no reason. They just don't um, wanna fold. Yeah. They think you have ace king all the time, yeah. <laughs> and they think you missed every time. It's they the never hand in range, man. It's so funny when you have aces. They're like, oh, I didn't put you on aces. It's like, well, <laughs> of course you did it. You just only <laughs> think we ever have ace king. king. It's, it's always, always ace, ace king. <laughs> <laughs> so a multi way, it's more complicated. So you want your decisions to be simple. So I would play pretty ABC. If you hit a good hand, bet enough to force them to respect you, but don't bet. Don't be crazy and risk your whole stack. Um, so those are a couple lessons to take away. And then on the turn, um, if you're in position, you can choose to either pot control. I would I would also recommend, by the way, in, in multi-way pot, if you bet the flop, what happens is usually one person will call. And, and let's say the turn is an interesting card. Like for example, let's say that the board was the same board we're talking about, king 10-4. Right. You have ace king. And you bet the flop and one person calls you. The turn is a jack. Okay, yeah. that's actually a bad card for your hand, even though it, it gives you more outs for Broadway and everything. There's a lot of king jack or jack 10 suited, right. um, or even ace queen, like hands like. A lot of hands that would continue and prove. Exactly, and and so if they check to you, they would check there if they binked that card. So this is a great spot now to pot control because your hand has a ton of showdown value and it's it's likely the best hand still. But it would really suck for you to bet here, and then they they uh, check raise you. Now you're now you're in a really gross spot. So if you are successful in thinning the herd and it's heads up, consider pot controlling at that point. Get to showdown in a lot of cases because your hand's likely going to be the best hand on the river in in a lot of scenarios. But you're not really going to be wanting to play for stacks with a gross card like a jack or a queen on the turn, you know. It sounds crazy, but even an ace, like you have ace king and the flop, the board is king 10 four, and then they call you and the turn is an ace. There's a lot of uh, queen jacks in their hands. So if they check it to you, I might just check back right. for a couple of reasons. One, one is it induces bluffs on the river. They'll just spaz out and bluff, bet the river. But also like if they just check the river, then you probably have the best hand and you can bet for value. All the, another thing is I don't like betting if you know, I'm frustrated if I get raised, you know, if, um, yeah, I guess that's pre flop and post flop, you know, if I turn a lot of equity and I bet and I get raised, it's pretty annoying. Yeah. How sick. And so the way Faraz Jaka said it, he said, how sick in your stomach would you be if you had, if you raised and then got re raised and had to fold your hand? Yeah, exactly. Like that's why I kind of avoid three betting hands, like eights or nines. Mm -hmm. pre-flop um because if i get four bet then you know it's pretty annoying to fold yeah and and actually some of the top pros i would three bet them but they actually play extremely well multi-way agreed so, so if you're in position and someone raises like middle position and you're in the cutoff and you have pocket nines that's a really good hand to flat with so you want to be flatting with a lot of your middle pairs like anywhere from fours up to like um even up to jacks you know what i mean for sure um, because those play so well post flop and um they also you also want to keep those in your calling range because you want to be also calling with hands like king queen suited and hands that are too good to, to three bet and have to fold to a four bet you want to just kind of be able to have good calling hands 
You want to be three betting hands that just kind of suck, or they're just nuts. Right. Ace ten offsuit sucks, but it's it's a good enough hand to three bet, but it sucks to just call with. I think the m most important aspect, in my opinion, of multi-way pot is is one is you got to learn how to pot control. That is so crucial. Don't bloat pots with a marginal hand because then you're, you, you don't want to be making nasty decisions with your whole stack on the river. So learn how to pot control. But the next thing is you got to stop thinking about your cards so much and you got to really, um, you got to be paying attention to the players and watch how they handle their chips, kind of watch what they're thinking about. And it's it, insane, but a lot of times players even go, they shake their head no. <laughs> they'll literally shake their head no and they'll check. And like they're, they will give you so much information when you're paying attention to their body language. And a lot of times when I bet, I found a trick is when I'm betting, I actually watch my opponents. I watch them whenever I bet because I don't look into their eyes. I'm not one of those guys that's kind of too weird for me. I don't yeah. like, you know, like having makes that. It, makes it really uncomfortable. <laughs> poker intimacy. But, but, <laughs> um, but what I do is like I'll make a bet and then I actually watch how they react to my bet. So instead, of, like a lot of people will make a bet and then they just like look at the table and they're trying to conceal themselves. An even more advanced move I think is if you're so curious on how they react to you, then you won't be, con you won't be revealing the kind of tells on your hand. Because you make a bet and then I, what I usually watch is their hands. Hands is where people give off the most tells ever. So watch their hands and watch their body language, how they react to you betting. So if they kind of like, they get a little nervous and they're almost like hesitant, and then they just call you, you can go ahead and use that information on the turn in the river on your decisions and what you want to do. There's a lot of information. So, so watch how they react to your bets versus just trying to like hide your tells. Does it make sense? It's like, yeah. that's a... It helps out a lot, especially deciding whether to get value or not on Future Street. It gives away a lot of information about their hand for the most part. And you, you want to really be careful for hands like um, stupid two pairs and bottom sets and things like that. Like, so someone's slow playing king 10 offsuit and you have ace king. The flop is king 10 4. A lot of players will just like check in and they're trying to trap you. You can dodge traps by checking back in a lot of scenarios. But you still have to like, it's a weird little dance. You have to bet to protect your hand, but you also got to like pot control a lot. So. You gotta, you gotta um, really be paying attention to the players and, and everything. One last aspect of multi-way pots I wanna talk about is board textures. Okay, so on extremely dry boards or paired boards, you're gonna pl I, I would recommend playing those a lot different than uh, draw heavy boards. So in a multi-way pot, for example, if I have, um, I, I actually prefer if you're gonna bluff, I, I, li I really, I like playing the dry boards a lot. Because on a dry board, it's so difficult for anybody to have much of anything. On a dry board, you're like so let's say that you raised a preflop and you get four callers. You know they're calling you with a very wide range. So the board comes out and it's 9-9-3. Um, nine, nine, you have ace-king. And they all check it to you. If, if you're, I'm, I don't do this a lot, but this actually would be somewhat of a decent spot to bluff. And um, so this is where I would bet a smaller amount. If I was going to bluff at this spot, I would bet a smaller amount and I would watch the body language of the players sure. because they're not going to continue very often. And like, they'll let you know real quick if they have a nine, they'll start kind of Hollywooding and then they might raise you or they'll just kind of call you and check in the dark or something. Yeah. Usually they raise and turn their hand face up. Exactly. And that's where you want to down. You don't need to bet a lot on the dry boards. Like if you're going to a dry board, it's really hard for people to have anything, so you can bet a little bit and get a, the same, accomplish the same thing as a eighty dollar, a thirty dollar bet would accomplish the same thing as an eighty dollar bet. For sure, and you get a lot of small to medium pocket pairs to fold that do do. Right, the, and they'll probably call you once, like like let's say nine nine three pocket fives will call you on the flop, but let's say the turn is a queen and now it's heads up. Like so, you bet the flop thirty bucks, and one person calls you. But you can tell that they don't have a nine. They don't have trip nines, but they're kind of they they're just being sticky. They might have a three or they have a small pocket pair. If the turn is a queen, that's actually a good like if you're playing against an amateur player, like I, I often will once again on the turn, the turns are the really good places to make your move. That's where I might make a bigger, stronger bet. I might bet, you know, like 
two thirds pot or three quarters pot on the turn. And that's if a scary overcard comes and you can tell they don't have a nine. So if I'm gonna incorporate bluffs in multi-way pots, it's really more like you're building up, you're building up a scenario of a story where you can push them off on later streets. Right. It's, that, that goes back to what we talked about earlier, um, mm -hmm. getting more respect on turn bets. Exa exactly. Now, if the turn is a deuce, I actually would probably just check back and kind of like, I wouldn't, I would give up because um, that doesn't change anything. So if their if their hand was the best on the flop, it'll probably be best on turn. So they're not going to fold to your turn bet. Um, but if a scary card does come on the river and they're kind of a weaker passive player, then you can you can go ahead and make a move on a river. But um, but that's the cool thing is like that's why you bet small on the flop. It's still you can weed out a lot of the players because they won't continue unless they have something most of the time. Even if it's a little bit of something, they'll continue. But on a dry board, it's so hard for anyone to have anything. So versus now, if we we go to now here's a cool bluff is ace king and if you're out of position if you check it and then someone kind of bets and maybe someone thinks about it and they call and you can tell that they both have marginal hands that's actually a good spot to like to raise i i'll check raise there even if it doesn't make as much sense to like a good player people just see a check raise is so strong yeah and they'll give it a lot of respect because on most types of boards you i mean them specifically they can't have anything um and they'll take your raise as, oh. He's got something. Yeah. He's got an overpair. He's like got a nine. Nine, nine, three. Like, oh, he's got a nine, mm -hmm. obviously, even though you don't. But Yeah, and I, I would treat a nine, nine, three board, by the way, is very different than a, a jack, jack, ten board. Because sure. jack, jack, ten still has draws that they'll call you. They'll call you with king, queen, or eight, nine. They'll call you with. So they'll call you a lot lighter with jack, jack, ten, because there's still straight draws. And those cards hit their range more. Exactly, yeah. So that's what you want to be thinking about as well. But if you go over to textured boards, um, suited like five, six, nine, two diamonds, I'm never bluffing ace king on that board. Yeah, no. Not even with an ace of diamonds, with a naked ace of diamonds. I'm never like trying to like, people will not fold. They're going to call you with pair, the straight draw, flush draws. Yeah, and they're Any draws continuing, even no. on a turn bet. Um, I mean, it's just lighting money on fire. Exactly. Even even if you triple barrel, you're like they're gonna literally call you down, and then on the river they're gonna be like, "Pot so big, I might as well call." Like, and you're just not gonna get the respect you need, and people just cannot fold their draws. So I would really like play the draw boards very ABC straight up. I don't bluff at those boards very often. Even okay, what I might do is let's say I, I flop an amazing draw. Let's say I have Jack Ten of Diamonds. And the flop is nine, seven, five, two diamonds. So I got two overs, a flush draw, and a straight draw. I actually might, um, I actually might bet a little bit on the flop, more for like information and also to build a decent pot in case I smash the, the turn. Agreed. You know, um, I wouldn't think it's a bad spot to be ready to get it all in either. Exactly. That big of a draw. Because, I mean, at worst, you're flipping majority of the time. So. Yeah, and also, you uh, kind of back to what we were saying before, is like, how sick would you have to be if you had to fold your hand? And I wouldn't be sick at all if, I, if someone raised me. I'd be very comfortable getting my, my money in, you know, because I, I have such a good hand, you know? So if you're comfortable getting your stack in in a multi-way pot, then I think that that's an appropriate time to be betting. Agreed. You know? So, yeah, man. That's that's uh, that's some good stuff for the multi-way pot, I think. Let's go over just a couple minutes of uh, short stack play. Like, so what are your what are your questions or thoughts initially? Bluffing against short stacks, I feel, is hard, especially here in Texas. You know, I'd say between the one 100 and 150 range, um, I'd consider that a short stack in these one two games. For sure. Yeah. Um, and I just find it hard sometimes continuing against them, especially if I whiff the flop. So I'm just gonna kind of blast with what some some ideas. So first of all, I don't really bluff them unless I have outs. Right. Unless I have outs, like two overs. So so if I raised it to 25 bucks pre-flop, and a short stack calls me, he's got one 
He's got um, 125 in a stack. He calls 25. First of all, you you should your red flag should be going like, if he's calling $25 of this 125 stack, he's got something he likes. And then let's say one other kind of loose player calls. If the flop is uh, queen, 10, three, and you have ace king suited, you have a backdoor flush draw with two overs, a Broadway draw. Um, the pot is 75. Um, I'm, and, and a three person pot, I'm, I'm C betting this all day because, but what I'm, I might do is I might bet slightly, I might bet 50 because um, what I'm really trying to do is like, I'm, I'm okay getting it in with that short stack. I'm gonna gamble with them because my hand is so good and it's got tons of equity and I'm, I'm, I want to fold out pocket eights or pocket sevens. I'm okay if they, those kind of hands fold. I'm even okay to fold that equity, like hands like King Jack, if they flopped open-ended, I'm okay if they fold those hands. Um, and as, as crazy as it sounds, a lot of them are gonna fold a 10 on that board. Majority of the time, yeah. They'll never fold a queen, um, but a lot of them will just uh, spaz out and they'll call you with ace jack, or they'll um, even king jack, and you'll, you'll win with ace high in a lot of scenarios. And if you just bet 50, you're really, what you're really trying to do, you're happy to take the pot down, but you're really kind of trying to push out the, the big stack that calls you, and then you're really trying to put pressure on the little stack. Um, but but I only do this with hands that I can catch up with. If I have a hand like seven six suited that I raised with, and then that it's this board, I'm just literally just I'm I'm giving. Yeah, so I just let them have it because because these little stacks, they're the short stacks, they're almost always going to play very tight and very ABC, especially on the flop. If I flop a queen, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna play it the same way as I played ace-king suited. If I flop a 10, I actually would probably check um, for, for pot control, and also, um, it also just under my hand a lot, you know? Gives them a chance to bluff. Yeah, it gives them a chance to bluff, and um, but then you can kind of check the side. Like, you check call and then check the side on the turn. Like, if you check a 10, like if you raise with ace-10 suited, and the board is queen-10-4, if you just check it and then they just jam all in for like a hundred bucks into the seventy-five dollar pot, um, I mean you could you could hero call that you could call that, but I, I actually would probably just fold. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You could um, unless unless it's just a very loose player that so a lot of players. Okay, this is actually where the good stuff. Like this is it. You kind of need to identify the player. You need to you need to segregate it and classify them into one or two categories. There's the short stack nits. And then there's the short stack gamblers. So there's the short stack guys that like to buy in for a hundred bucks, but with their, their, they have like 1500 bucks in their pocket and they like to buy in for a hundred dollars and they're, they kind of like to fire and try to steal a lot of pots and run up a hundred bucks to 2000, but they're gambling. So they're going to just go all in all the time with, like a maniac. And against those kinds of players, I'm probably going to call with ACE 10, yeah, sure. calling with ACE King, ACE Jack. I'm calling with like very, um, I'm calling a little a lot lighter. <laughs> Agreed, but against like the person who's playing tight, short stack, um, calls 25, 125 starting stack. I mean, just I'd give it up. Exactly. Yeah. So you, you don't need to. Um, you're not going to win a lot of your money from those players, anyways. Um, where you win a lot of your money from those players is if you straddle five and you get six limpers, and if you have ace king on the button, you raise it up to. 45 or 50 or whatever you do and then they they just call you or they'll check raise they'll just limp raise you all in those are the spots where you can crack knit like the short stack knits but um you know what i'm saying where you can get it all in like you're really kind of just you're wanting to kind of apply pressure against them but you want to be jabbing at a lot of pots and then just kind of like leaning on them but but you don't want to lean on them with with you don't it's kind of like the stock market. You, you want to risk the least amount of money to get the job done. For sure. So you just don't want to overcommit yourself to where exactly. if they jam, you're not forced into calling. Exactly. And so so you want to really just kind of like lean on those kinds of players because they are calling you with a lot of hands that like, they might be good, they might like their hand, but they just, they're going to miss a lot of boards. So they'll just fold. So so like in a head, especially heads up. So let's say I raised it to 20 bucks pre-flop with, King 10 suited, a, a normal hand you would raise, and a, 
a tight short stack calls you. Um, they call me and um, they only had 125 bucks in their stack. Let's say the board is uh, ace, seven, three. Okay, you have king 10 suited. You don't even have a backdoor flush draw. Um, you could go run a runner straight, but here's the thing is, they are calling you with a lot of aces in their hands. So that if they check it to me at this point, um, this is actually a very good board to bet at in a heads up pot because um, these, pa I guess a passive type player, because they're gonna call me with a lot of hands that they like, but um, of course they'll never fold an ace, but they are calling you with all the middle pocket pairs. They're calling you with king queen suited, king jack suited, like all kinds of hands like that. And so if they just see an ace and they miss, they're gonna they're playing very straightforward. Yeah, yeah, but you don't need to bet a lot on the flop. So if I raise it to twenty pre flop and they call, I might bet like I might bet um eighteen bucks on the flop. Or eighteen to twenty two. Something eighteen so, to twenty. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because it's kind of a dry board and it's just they, they don't want to their their chips are precious to them, so fifteen dollars they might I mean, are they, what are they going to do? Call you with king queen off? You know what I'm saying? Like on an A side board, and these kinds of players are they're not going to really continue unless they have something. So you want to stab at those kind of boards heads up. But um, if they call you on the flop, I, I just kind of like give up. Or if I turn a pair or something, I just get to showdown. But if they check call me on the flop, they they just call me pre flop. They just check call. They they most of the time have something, and I don't even try to bluff because there's just so many bigger pots you can win from more players on the table. Yeah, better spots. Better spots, yeah, exactly. And then if the, if a river comes out and they're kind of like, you can tell that they're a little annoyed, I might do a river bluff, like a $35 river bluff, because sometimes they call literally just to see if they hit something. But um, if they just kind of, like the hand has been defined and they missed it, and you can kind of sense that they missed a lot of draws or whatever, um, or they just kind of call you once with pocket fives on the flop. They just called you to see if they could, just to be stubborn. You can make a $35 river bet. But that, once again, you're not, you're, not, you're not betting huge. You're not trying to bluff their whole stack in because you, you're kind of jabbing a lot of these, these players. So yeah, that's like my tips for that. And you don't win a lot of money from those players anyways. You win your money in the big pots against like bigger stacks. Yeah, no doubt. So I don't spend a ton of my time trying to bluff short stacks. <laughs> yeah, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not very not very uh, profitable compared to like what you can do in, against bigger stacks. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, there's better spots down the road for sure. Um, assuming you have like Ace King, they called me with the worst Ace. Flops Ace Seven Four Rainbow. Um, obviously, getting it in would be an option. Um, I would still see bet that with the eighteen because you have to protect your range. So like. Balance. Yeah, so if I have ace king on an ace high flop, I would bet 18, but I would also bet king 10 suited, and I would even bet pocket eights or something like, like my pocket pairs because it, it helps you see where you're at, but it also you're kind of okay to fold out equity. Yeah, for sure. You're okay if they if fold they have out. An ace, they'll let you know if not, they're exactly. Yeah, so that's it, brother. All right, peace.